Hey beer lovers, we are still on our epic American road trip, like the fourth one of this year. I keep saying that like it's a new thing. Uh, and we have come to the home of chocolate. Yeah, we're in Hershey's. We are in Hershey. We're in Hershey. Hershey, <laughs> not Hershey's. That is the chocolate from yeah, Hershey. It is. But there's um, so much more to Hershey than just chocolate, right? Absolutely. So we have come to Trobes, which is a brewery I've heard so much good stuff about, particularly from industry people all over the world. Yeah and they're making some sensational Germanic and Belgian beers, um, but also some great IPAs. Uh, and that's kind of what we talk about today uh, in this episode, while we go hop sniffing with the founders, John and Chris. Hop truffling at Trobe. I was a little bit jealous I didn't get involved, but Johnny, it looked like you had an absolutely wonderful time. We did, yeah. It's a really fascinating little look at how a brewery structures its beers, comes up with its recipes, and also interprets the flavors and works out how to use them. So if you ever wanted to learn the ins and outs of using hops and beer, this is the video for you. Before we met the founders, we got a tour of the huge facility and saw firsthand how special the place is. It reminded us of Allagash, not just in the Belgian influence and ton of wood, but in how they had grown to become a regional brewer without ever compromising on the philosophy they started with. Their beers were absolutely stellar too. Their core IPA, big, brash and piney, their doppelbock like liquid bread, and their small batch stuff varied and exciting. And we were about to find out why. So I'm here with Chris and John, uh, and we're gonna do something a little bit unusual and really exciting, something I've thought about doing on the channel occasionally, but not on this scale. This is really exciting. But first, uh, I want to get a sense from you guys, like where did Trogues come from? It's, it's an old company and it's a really big company now, doing super well. So where did it come from? Well, I don't, I don't, we don't feel old or big. That's, Sorry, I didn't mean to reply to you guys. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, this is, so this is our 22nd year open. John and I started the brewery in 1997. Uh, both born and raised in Pennsylvania and after high school had been talking about possibly getting into brewing. Um, we kind of went two different directions. I started home brewing. John eventually went and worked for a brewery for some time in Colorado and then that brought us back home to start, start Trogues in Harrisburg uh, mm -hmm. in 97. So um, a lot has happened to get here. Yeah. And, and certainly we uh, still feel fresh and young and, and continually evolve uh, each year. I, um, so while I was doing research ready for this interview, I was looking through the, the Great American Beer Festival uh, medals that you guys have got. It's incredibly impressive, particularly the Troganator, like what first won gold maybe even two decades ago and won it recently like three or four years ago. Like, is that the beer that has really helped you guys on the way? or? I mean, Troganator is kind of our, the backbone of the brewery. If I was going to be stranded on an island, that's a beer I'm going to want. That's, that's what it'll <laughs> You'd take. have a good time there as well, probably. Well, that's that's also like sustenance, you know, it's liquid yeah. bread. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we build a lot off of that. And from Troganator uh, and Mad Elf, really side by side. Mad Elf's not really a beer that would go to the GABF because it's not really a style. Yeah. Um, but that's our holiday celebration. Like, it's, it's not the holidays without Mad Elf. Yeah. Uh, so, those two beers hand in hand have, have really built the brewery. Um, so, you guys have got, you got like, Quite a Belgian and Germanic We're kind all of over origins. The place. I right. think, well, origin-wise, you know, I think a lot of a lot of breweries when we started out 22 years ago were kind of focused more on brewing specific styles, traditional styles. Mm -hmm. And I think you know we we began like that and then just kind of went off on uh, many different directions based on what our at that point our taste preferences were and our, our interest from a brewing style. Yeah, yeah. And you've you've now like you've now got some IPAs and some seasonal IPAs as well. So brewing the. I, what, do you brew the really modern IPAs or are you West Coast lovers or are you, again, doing everything? You know, it, it, it really, we don't drive through style. We right. look more we're interest, what we're interested in from a, a component, like flavor component standpoint. So we look at the ingredients first. Uh, I'm, we love technique. So we, we always look at different techniques for different types of beers. And that's why I think in the beginning we were gravitating toward, more towards lagers or more towards open fermented uh, so the German vice beers. The process itself is like, Super cool. Yeah, uh, it's that dichotomy of of um, the art and science together, is is what's fun for us. So that, and that takes us. I mean, if you think about it, that's not much of a constraint. So we really can go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So we we're inspired by a trip, or we're inspired by an ingredient, or inspired by a, a food a chef made, and we're like, well, what do we want to make to drink with this? Yeah. Um, and kind of go from there. And that's that's taken us all over the place. And then as we've 
evolved over the years, we're constantly exploring and, and trying new things, um, we become a lot more connected to the individual ingredients and how they become flavor in beer, uh, which definitely w one of the coolest parts is our hops. So going to the hop fields, walking the hop fields, seeing what's being um, cultivated, but also then what's going to be cultivated. So the experimental hops that are coming up, being developed so they can grow them better for the farmers, but taking those and helping adapt them to a beer is super fun and cool. Like we have a bunch of beers that we have now started with an experimental number and then ended up getting named and now are in regular beers. So right. like that whole, you know, so many different hops and then depending on where they're grown and how, when they're harvested and then how they're dried can radically affect the flavor that the hop has. And then when we take that and use it in the beer, it can totally change. Okay, well let's uh, talk me through what we've got here. So this is something that you guys do quite a lot in the brewery. We do. So we have two things going on here. We're, we're using you know, real world ingredients on this side uh, that represent individual characteristics or flavors in the hops. Yep. So these are uh, pelletized hops that we've ground up. And what I normally do is kind of just start putting them in buckets. So these will be the more like, well, this is like the other, other category where it'll have a lot of depth and a huge amount of explosive aroma. And then I have two other buckets I generally do. I'll use one that'll be on like a surface hop. So it'll be, it'll be bright. Uh, but it won't have a backbone to it. Yeah. So it might have a huge passion fruit aroma, or it might have a huge lemon rind aroma, but it might not have a lot of depth. So that'll be the last bucket. So then we'll just kind of talk through, like, what are we interested in? So if you smell Chinook, you're gonna get a little pine and a little grapefruit. If you go down the Simcoe, you're gonna get the same grapefruit, let's say, but a hair of the creme caramel. So you can go down, let's say, the grapefruit path, the pink grapefruit path, and decide if you want a white pine needles, which is also has a citrus kind of aroma to it, or if you want a little depth through creme caramel. Yeah. Now, it's not going to taste like creme caramel by any means, but that's what supports the grapefruit. But I'm, I'm already Simcoe. learning something already because I suddenly understand a little bit more why Simcoe and West Coast hops, whether using crystal malts or caramel malts, right. like that, that's a synergy there that they found that has worked really well so. across endless IPAs. Totally agree. Yeah. So if Simcoe, depending on when it's harvested, will have more depth from the creme caramel or more of like a cat pee aroma. Yep. The, the, and the dank, so the weedy, the... Maybe dank and weedy is yep. a better way to put it. Uh, so I gravitate more towards the creme caramel or the mango side of it. Yep. So those are typically a little earlier on the harvest. Um, but you can absolutely select hot the Simcoe for a little more of that dank. Um, and that'll, that'll, to me, kind of masks a little bit of that grapefruit side, but you can kind of build from there. So if you go, uh, maybe this is a good way to start it. This is our next seasonal called Blizzard of Hops. So it's for the, the cooler months of the year. It's rolling out usually early November through February. So this has a strong amount of that hop in the aroma. And then Galaxy is yeah. a huge part of the strength. We don't have it here. Pick it up right away. But you should smell. Uh, it's a similar hop to the Chinook. But you've got a, a really bright. I get. It's weird to say bright about an aroma, but often when you have Galaxy, it's it's bold and it's raucous and it's sort of. Yeah. I so find it very piney and savory sometimes, and this one's. Galaxy can get out of control. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's. When it comes to the party, like it, it takes over. So you have to really, if you wanted to do that, great. You let it do it and it just takes over, which is awesome. I love it. Huge fan of Galaxy. We temper it with these two hops. So you're going to hit El Dorado has a nice um, pineapple edge to it. And then you, the Chinook will give the grapefruit with a little bit of the pine. So if we dominate on the two, let's say softer hops, and we just give it a little bit of Galaxy, you're gonna roll this way. So we can take that then um, from our taste memory and we can build from there. So if you, if you take that beer, change the yeast slightly, we can intensify the fruit. And then from there, you can add this, let's say bucket, 
and start to build juicy and fruity. Um, and then we can build, let's say, oops, juice through, this is a Zaka. So that to me is like stone fruit. So you have this deep, rich, juicy stone fruit as a hair of the pine. So if you want to take, let's say blizzard, which is um, Chinook and Eldorado as a major component and Galaxy as a minor component, we can then balloon that out. We can put a fruitier yeast in the beer. You can tame the alcohol down or, or drive the alcohol up and that'll also change the flavor and aromatic quality yeah. and then start messing around with the hop. So we'll, you peel Galaxy out and you throw in Azaka you're gonna get rid of that kind of wild piney character from Galaxy World and make it juicy. Yeah. So now you're down the juicy IPA path. So I, I learned it the hard way. What you're talking about with these buckets, I, I brewed a, a Christmas beer for my family, which I try to do every year. And I made, the brief was a juicy pale ale. So I went, I went New England yeast and Azaka and it was the flabbiest, yeah. most <laughs> undrinkable beer. I think I, yeah. like technically it was there, but it was just, you zero can. balance and zero bite and zero sort of uh, bright notes. Super easy to balance that out. You get a punched up. Ozaka is a really awesome beer to start with, for a, especially for a juicy IPA. Yeah. Punch it up with some citra and you go down the passion fruit route or you go down the, has a little bit of orange in there, or lychee. Uh, or you can go the other direction. You can jump it up, you hit it with some Calypso or, or mosaic. You, 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 Ozaka mosaic combo, it's almost like a cheater combo. Like you can't go wrong with those yeah. two. We've been. I focus on three, and I don't know why, but when we do one, I can't get to where I want. If we do two, we generally get close, and we're always like, oh, if it just had a little more of this or a little more of that. Uh, so we just started doing three. So we can, we always hit it with two, and then we do, like we usually start with two in our recipe, and then we say, what else does it need? Right, so you, well, so you do a pilot batch and go, right. what's missing, and then you pick that extra yeah. hot. Right. Yeah, or we'll do one batch and break it into four like different tanks or two different tanks. Oh, okay, right. And try yeah. different hop combos. Yeah. So it's like mosaic and citra, that combo is a home run, like right out of the gate. Yep. And then you can easily build other beers just by adding in that third hop, that third player. Uh, and if you want to get a little more complicated, that's just on the dry hopping side. So if you back into the boil, you can hit hops hot at different times to build in different flavors. Yeah, slightly different profiles out of it. Yeah, so you could have two hops on dry hop and one hop in Whirlpool, one hop in boil yeah. to bring out the juice or to bring out the grapefruit or bring out the pine or sky's the limit. If you see, so you've got your, your core IPA. Yeah. Is, now your, is that your biggest selling beer now? Perpetual IPA is yeah. number one. Yeah. Um, have you seen taste sort of change since that came out? So that's seven, seven-ish years old. I'm not sure if I'd say so much the taste of change, but maybe the, 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 the IPA world has gotten a lot bigger. Right. So I think you're starting to see kind of different segments within the IPA. Yeah. I mean, the Perpetual definitely is very much a West Coast classic style IPA. It's, for us, it's still growing, but we're, we're, we're finding, or we're reaching more people through, I think, some of our smaller scratch beers that we're brewing that is kind of more similar to what we're talking about here. Yeah, it's interesting to see, like, I look at these, all these fruits and different ingredients here and I can sort of see in the descriptors people are using for the IPAs now it's very right. much you know the green herbs are going that way and the, yep. yeah, the really can... juicy stuff is coming this way even the lemons and those sort of things are starting to if you... get harder to find yeah if you pull the any or anything green herbaceous tea uh, lime kind of mint like if a hop smells like mint we won't we typically throw it out <laughs> um, and it's always been that way yeah so if you take perpetual and kind of jump out in all sorts of directions we're seeing the, the palette just be a, explore more so while before like citra is a perfect example where when it came out in 2002 2003 somewhere in there we used to use it in very small amounts here and there but it was it was so strong like it was foreign to us as brewers we're like there's no way, like, I don't know how we would ever use this hop. And now it's the number one hop that we use. Yeah. So we went from Cascade, which is that very classic orange and kind of tea-like aroma and transitioned now to Citra. So that, I think for us, that's how we've changed. Like we, we went from, that really symbols the, what we've changed flavor-wise for us. Um, that Citra now kind of builds everything from there. So. You don't have to go fruit bomb, you don't have to go citrus bomb, you don't have to be 
down one path of citrus, it, you can use it for all sorts of different things. Uh, and we see the same thing with the IPA drinker, is willing to try other flavors now. So it, it just kind of spiders out. It's why they're here, they want to try all the different yeah. flavors to some extent, they're looking to. So, and we're super into the why, so we're constantly trying to figure out why things are tasting and smelling the way they are, and diving from an ingredient stance. And then we like to share that with our customers. So it's not just, hey, come try the hoppiest beer we've ever brewed. It's, hey, let's understand why these ingredients add that flavor or aroma to it. Yeah. Uh, and they dig it. They, they're totally into that, like exploring with us and, and trying it out. So I hope that was really helpful to you guys. Um, I learned a huge amount. I've reevaluated Simcoe, which is one of my favorite hops. Yeah. And I was taught about it. Uh, I mean, we, we sort of, we're aware of sensory panels and that kind of thing. But the way these guys do it, for me, it was like, wow, of course, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I Why think... not get all these real world things and, and sniff them directly next to the hops? Because then you can really pull apart the components and what you actually like as opposed to what you necessarily don't like. Yeah, I mean, most brains are, are, are visual and being able to see exactly what you were smelling, put them together both, both in your nose and in your eyes is really helpful for creating recipes but also deconstructing them like we will now i think whenever we taste the <coughs> beer we'll be thinking about those real world flavors and we'll be thinking about what the brewer's intention was yeah when they were doing it and what they might have looked at while they were developing that recipe and i think intention's a really important thing in beer you know you can have a delicious beer but was it what the brewer intended maybe not uh, and we're going to hopefully now have a greater insight to what people were looking for. Yeah, my hand luggage from now on is going to be full up of sensory jars. Just but jars of juicy fruit chewing gonna, gum. I don't think we'll get those through uh, customs though. No, maybe not, <laughs> that would look slightly dodgy.